The College of Knowledge welcomes you to the University of the Airwaves. This is the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Now, sit back and relax and listen to this. This is Radio Sputnik. Catherine Gunn is going to be everywhere over the next few weeks and months, although it's probably Kira Knightley that people will have in their mind when they think of her. But for me, Catherine Gunn is a hero. I interviewed her for the mother of all talk shows about the situation she found herself in in the run-up to the Iraq war when she became a true British hero. Listen to this. Well, younger viewers and listeners may not know, but I was one of the leaders of the great anti-war movement in Britain, which moved more people on more demonstrations than any cause any organization ever has in the history of these islands, millions upon millions of us, demonstration after demonstration, protest after protest, but we failed. And that's the only regret that I have from that era uh, in which I was heavily involved. Everything that's happened since in Iraq, of course, wholly vindicates us. There's no question about that. There's nobody will turn up to debate against me now in 2019, arguing that the Iraq war was right. But it was not, of course, a foregone conclusion that we would turn out right. Certainly, the mass media, the political class, and the deep state itself was wholly convinced, it seemed, uh, that the course of action they were on was not just right and proper, but was vitally necessary. Many of them have begun to repent at leisure, usually well-paid repentance at leisure, as multi-millionaires, in Mr. Blair's case, a hundred million pound personal fortune. But looking at his face, I'm pretty sure uh, that the conscience which God gave him has not entirely disappeared. I feel sure that he has difficulty sleeping at night. And because I'm a believer, I believe that he, like me, like you, like everyone, will face a judgment day. And on that judgment day, he's going to have a lot of questions to answer. Anyway, you, if you're old enough, will recall that the United States government led by George W. Bush, the British government led by Tony Blair, uh, were doing everything that they possibly could to persuade the members of the Security Council to endorse their uh, decision to invade and occupy Iraq. They knew that France was going to veto it because the president of France, who died this week, Jacques Chirac, uh, was going to veto uh, any attempt to get the Security Council to endorse the war. They knew that, but they wanted symbolically to win a majority of the countries on the Security Council so that they could claim at least some moral superiority in their judgment. They failed, but they tried, and they tried fair means and foul. They tried legal means and they tried illegal. They bugged, they burgled, they browbeat, they bribed, they twisted arms, even necks of the countries on the Security Council at that time to get them to uh, vote for the Bush and Blair war. And they failed at that. But the methods that they were using were, of course, absolutely illegal. They were crimes. They were crimes against the Secretary General of the United Nations, who was being bugged. They were crimes against the Security Council of the United Nations, in theory, the most important and powerful body in the world uh, today. And we know that they were doing this only because of the bravery, the moral standing, the moral fiber of my next guest on the show this evening. 
because Catherine Gunn was an employee of GCHQ and suddenly this information directly from the horse's mouth, from the American administration's mouth about the crimes they were committing in New York in the United Nations building crossed her desk. Now she was bound by the Official Secrets Act never to impart information that came her way in the course of her work. But she took the view that what was being planned in Iraq was a far greater crime. And of course now that looks obvious. Then it took a great deal of moral clarity and courage. And she showed it. And she stood up ready to be punished, prosecuted for the small crime that she committed in order to try and bring about an end to a far, far bigger crime. As I said earlier, there's now a docudrama, a movie, in which Catherine is played by Kira Knightley, and that film is called Official Secrets. And I understand from people who have seen it that Kira Knightley plays Catherine Gunn brilliantly. And she's on the line now, not Kira Knightley, but Catherine Gunn. I'm glad to say, Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Now, uh, tell me, first of all, let's get the Hollywood out of the way. What's it like to be played by Kira Knightley? And did she do a good job representing you? Um, well, she's done a, a tremendous job, I think. Um, in some ways, um, she comes across perhaps more um, fiercely than I did, maybe. But um, <laughs> I think she's um, she's done a tremendous job. But I have to say it's very surreal. And here I am sat in Turkey, washing dishes, cooking the dinner, and um, and it doesn't feel real in actual fact. Um, so <laughs> well, what can I say? Uh, uh, you know, you're washing dishes, making dinner, and speaking to a very large audience across the world here on the Mother of All Talk Shows, and we're grateful to you for that. Let's take you back, take the viewers and listeners back, uh, to the fateful uh, uh, day, uh, I don't know which day of the week it was, when this information first came your way. Can you describe to us how you felt when you saw and what you saw? Um, it was a Friday, um, and it was the end of January. It was a cold and, and bleak uh, January day. And um, I'd already come to the conclusion that the war was that they were proposing was illegal. I'd already researched, I'd bought a couple of books from my local bookstore and I read them. And, you know, I, I did as much research as I could across the board to find out what really was going on. And I'd come to the conclusion that it couldn't possibly be legal. And so when I saw that email, it was like a, a red flag to a bull. Um, I've kind of described it in some ways as if you you see a child crossing the road when a lorry is coming or something uh, and your immediate reaction is grab them do something get them out of harm's way and that was to be honest that was my gut reaction was that this was explosive it, it had the potential to de derail the 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 you know the train wreck that was coming and um so that that's what i did i leaked it the f well i i printed it off the following monday when i came back into work can you insofar as you're able can you tell us uh the the highlights uh, of that email um well it was from a person called Frank Koza at the NSA. Um, he, he was the chief of regional targets at the NSA. And um, basically the email was directed at a sort of section of analysts that would cover this sort of target area of countries, which included, so they specifically mentioned these countries that were sitting on the UN Security Council, the, the swing nations, which uh, the nations they wanted to influence in order to get this uh, m sort of moral majority that you were talking about. And they were um, Angola, Bulgaria, uh, Cameroon, Chile, 
Guinea and Pakistan. And so these six swing nations that were on the UN Security Council at the time, um, we were asked or, G, you know, GCHQ was being asked to um, intercept or, or to harvest, you know, tap, you know, to collect the, the uh, communications from their domestic and office um, sort of telephones, if you like, and fax or what have you back in, in that time. And, um, and to use, um, to gather, and I think this is a quote, to gather the whole gamut of information that would give, um, give the U.S. Re results favorable to U.S. goals and to further their interests. So, you know, as soon as I saw that sort of sentence in that language and to use all means necessary, I thought, you know, this is, this is scandalous. Now, when they say uh, all means necessary, they were, of course, implicitly uh, including illegal means. Yes. Bugging. Uh, yeah. It turned out that they had been bugging the Secretary General Kofi Annan himself, as well as bugging the diplomatic offices of these swing states inside the UN building, which has uh, special status uh, diplomatically, they were mm. bugging all communications uh, to and from the offices of those swing states. Now, given what your job was, you knew that that could not possibly legal, be legal, didn't you? Well, you could argue that many things that they do um, are illegal, but they would argue that they're covered by law to do so. Um, from my point of view, it was a line that I was not willing to cross because although, you know, many people on the opposite side of this argument would say, well, everybody does this. You know, we, we all want to know what's going on in other people's minds and this is how we do it. But what I couldn't accept was that this wasn't about gaining the upper hand in a trade negotiation or in some sort of, you know, uh, political field. This was to do with um, human lives, war and peace, and it was a country that posed no threat to anyone at the time, a country that had already been um, under over 10 years of, uh, as you know, as you well know, um, of genocidal um, sanctions. And beyond that war that had gone on previously. So it was a country that was utterly devastated. And, you know, frankly, I had, I could not see at all how they could possibly be a threat to anybody. Um, and that was why I had to act. And that's exactly, of course, how it uh, turned out. It turned out that the dictators in Iraq were the ones telling the truth and the democratic leaders of our country and the United States who were telling the lies. So what happened next, Catherine? Uh, you you uh, photocopied the email uh, by one means or another. It ended up uh, on the front page, I remember it still, uh, of, uh, ironically, the pro-war observer. Um, <clears throat> did you, were you shocked at the show that the paper gave? Uh, because it was a very big story. It was a very big splash, yes, and I, I was very, very shocked. Um, I hadn't, to be honest, I hadn't expected that that was how it would come out. Um, but I can see subsequently that they had to do that because they, they needed the maximum impact. Um, but it sort of left me hanging out in the cold and, um, and I had to, I didn't, well, I, I I could have carried on denying it, I suppose, um, but in reality, that's a, an almost impossible position to take um, because of, you know, a conscience <laughs> which dictates that you, you shouldn't lie. And so I felt um, ultimately that I had to come clean. Um, and that's what I did um, eventually after two days. And, and, what, uh, what, and what, can you remember the look on the face of the manager that you, uh, as it were, confessed to 
What did he or she say? Well, as it happens, she was very sympathetic. Um, now, in all, of, in all of my experience um, at that time, everybody that I came across basically was sympathetic. <laughs> um, when I told her, um, I simply said, the leak is me, or I did it, something to that effect. And she, uh, she just looked at me and sort of went, oh, Catherine. And then she put her arm around me. So I was, you know, I was not in any sort of um, immediate kind of um, danger. Danger. No, obviously not. But but that feeling that, you know, I'd got it off my chest and, and we could move forward and whatever was going to happen next would happen next. That sort of. Um, yeah, that, that was the next step. Did you, did you expect to be prosecuted? Indeed, the, the government took it right to the steps of the court, didn't they? Um, well, they arrested me. So they arrested me on suspicion of breaking the Official Secrets Act originally. So that, that happened the following day because they had to search the house. And, you know, 24 hours later, they, they actually gave me the formal um, uh words and then uh yes they so they didn't charge me straight away it was eight months before they decided to charge me by which time we just we'd kind of come to the conclusion that they probably weren't going to charge me so it was a surprise when they decided to charge me uh, what was the attitude of the police who arrested you i mean were you handcuffed were they rude no no not at all um no i was treated remarkably well in fact um, I have to say <laughs> um, that the uh, the CID, I guess it was, who came um, to interview me in Cheltenham, uh, when he finally interviewed me and then let me go, he said on the steps of Cheltenham Police Station, he said, um, it has been a, a pleasure to meet you, Mrs. Gunn. I'm just sorry it was under these circumstances. Um, well, so. how very British. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> quite heartwarming, uh, actually. So they, they did charge you and they were going to prosecute you uh, and they abandoned it at the last minute. Why do you think they did that? Well, that's a very good question and it continues to be interesting to me. Um, <laughs> at the time, we considered that it had something to do with the Attorney General's advice that eventually leaked much, much later. Um, but had the trial gone ahead, then the eternal, Attorney General's advice at the time, the, the first lot of his advice would have come out. Um, Describing the war as potentially illegal. That's right. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we considered the fact that uh, if, if a jury had decided to go presumably against the judge's wishes to convict. Um, and they said I was not guilty. Then the defense of necessity would have stood. Um, as a police as a, yeah. Yes. And, f and subsequently, we also considered the fact that the general election was coming up in 2005. Um, and, you know, a long trial whereby the the war in iraq was literally put on trial would not have looked good at all um however recently it was published in the guardian uh, by the then uh crown prosecution sir ken mcdonald that the reason for dropping the case was down to national security and i find that very intriguing yeah well i mean what can he mean by that well, you know, I've thought about that. And at first, the, my immediate reaction was that's just a blanket coverage for anything. Mm. Um, subsequently, I thought a little bit further on the issue and decided he may actually be telling somewhat the truth. Because in fact, this is pre-Snowden. And so the sort of umbilical relationship between GCHQ and NSA had not really been exposed. And the level and the extent to which GCHQ and NSA were, uh, you know, collecting data on a massive scale across both nations, that hadn't come out either. 
So it occurs to me that potentially may may be telling the truth that at the time it was because they did not even want to venture down that avenue in in the trial. Now you mentioned uh, Snowden and I mentioned earlier uh, Julian Assange who is now that he served time the appropriate level of time uh, that he was sentenced to for the jumping of bail is now explicitly being held uh, as a whistleblower. He is a political prisoner now. No one can deny that. And being held in uh, much less uh, uh, comfortable circumstances than I'm glad to say you were subjected to. He's behind the grim prison walls at Belmarsh in solitary confinement and maybe therefore years. Um, so whistleblowing hasn't gone uh, away. Uh, there are always people like you, like Snowden, like Assange, who are prepared to tell the truth, to blow the whistle on crimes and misdemeanors uh, amongst the powerful. Do you feel yourself a part of that community or uh, are you of the mind, well, you did what you had to do and now you've left it all behind? I think that's a good question. And actually, it's probably the reverse. At the time when the, when the case was dropped against me, all I wanted to do was go back to a sort of normal, um, you know, anonymous life. I wanted to recover from that experience because in fact it was fairly traumatic and for two years i i really had a hard time getting my head around it mm. um subsequently i became a mother and i i didn't want to you know do anything particularly um in that vein but now that the film has come out and of course that it's kind of miraculous that the film has <laughs> actually been made because it was a, a long and arduous process. Um, I feel the issues are so crucial and so relevant even to this day that, you know, I'm prepared to speak out and, and do interviews like this one with you, George, just to try and get the message through to people. Yes, because if, if uh, people don't blow the whistle, then great crimes can be committed in the darkness. Uh, and in our name, using our money, our resources, and which, if they backfire, as the Iraq war clearly has, uh, can make the world less safe for all of us. Um, oh, indeed, our own intelligence services said as much back then, that yes. that was the result of what an invasion of Iraq would uh, do, and, and they were right. Yes, but they would have been ignored were ignored if you they think were I, ignored. I'm, yes. make, I'm making a film right now it's almost finished uh, about the strange death of dr david kelly um mm. and uh, so of course i'm now deeply absorbed again in all these things and indeed mm -hmm. the, the iraq will follow me through the rest of my life as it will follow you and indeed whether people like it or not is following them um, mm -hmm. But the, the act, whatever happened to Kelly, and you'll need to wait to see my film to uh, discover mm -hmm. what that was, he, clearly whatever happened to him is intimately connected to the fact uh, that he spoke to a BBC journalist, then BBC journalist, uh, at, the, at the, uh, uh, the time of the war and mm -hmm. uh, told him certain things. What happened to you was because you told people. Uh, who were not legally authorized to know, but whom you felt it was your uh, civic duty as a, as a citizen uh, to impart this information, to get it out. And that's what Snowden did. That's what Assange uh, has done. Uh, is that, that's why, isn't it, they're treating uh, people like Assange particularly brutally because they realize that if uh, whistleblowing becomes a fashion or a habit or the norm, uh, then great crimes uh, may well regularly be exposed. Yes, well, I do remember that at the time my case was dropped, there were you know, arguments that this was going to open a can of worms, 
and literally there would be leaks, you know, day in and day out from GCHQ. And, you know, clearly that has not been the case. Um, you know, regardless of uh, how easy it becomes to blow the whistle, let's say, regardless of how uh, much protection you would have under the law, it would still be an incredibly rare event. Because even in the, in the public sector, in, in, in the US and in the UK, where they do have public interest defences in whistleblowing, you still see precious little whistleblowing. And even then, even with those protections, they are retaliated against. So the facts of the matter are that people, very few people um, are able or willing to come forward. And so coming down really hard like this on people, including Assange, who, who essentially is a, a publisher. A publisher, yes. And, and this, is a, this is a very dangerous um, avenue because, you know, they wouldn't go after The Guardian. They wouldn't go after the, the New York Times, let's say, because it's a much bigger institution to tackle, whereas Julian Assange is, is a man on his own. Uh, and, you know, this is a very dangerous precedent, um, as I'm sure you're well aware. So I am it, uh, only too well uh, aware. Uh, you're right. There will not be uh, daily examples of whistleblowing. Neither should there be. We need uh, intelligence services. We need to know uh, about threats uh, against the, the public realm, against the people in that realm. Uh, we need to know what bad people are planning to do. We need all these things. And we don't want uh, every secret exposed, every whistle blown. Uh, but regularly, more regularly than uh, unfortunately it should be, uh, there are uh, examples of our own governments doing such bad things, such wrong things, such things that will harm us all, uh, that whistleblowers like you uh, do come forward. Uh, they need to have courage, of which you had in abundance. They have to have character. They have to have moral uh, standing, moral fiber. Uh, and that's why I said at the beginning, you've always been something of a, a, a hero to me. Finally, how did, you, uh, how did you end up in Turkey? Is it connected uh, to what happened to you? Uh, not really. My husband is from Turkey, um, and uh, and we prefer the weather here. Yes. <laughs> and the cost Should of living is cheap. today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the cost of living is cheaper. It's is cheaper at the moment. Yes. <laughs> well, I wish you, and I'm sure I speak for everyone listening and watching uh, this interview, Catherine. I wish you every success to you, your husband, your children. Uh, and long life uh, to you. You have written Thank your you name uh, into the noble history uh, of those who stand up against that which is wrong. Catherine Gunn, who in the form of Kira Knightley is currently appearing on your cinema screens in a wonderful new film called Official Secrets. Catch it if you can. Thanks for listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Be sure to tune in this weekend for the next live episode, Sunday at 7 UK time. Search YouTube, Facebook or Twitter for hashtag moats and you'll find the live stream. Until next time.